Supposing that there were a thousand Wonka bars in the world, and during the contest you each opened a certain number of them, you would have a certain chance of winning. That number is a probability. Everyone understand? Yes, Danny Tyburn? What is the probability that five white kids found Wonka's golden tickets? Excuse me, what? The golden tickets. All five were found by white kids. So, what is the probability of that happening? Wonka's an international candy brand, after all. Seems highly unlikely. I, I can't figure that one out. Hmm. But maybe if I research the demographics of 1970s sugar producers and weigh it against global distribution maps... Hold on, Danny! Give me 15 minutes. I can do this for you. The rest of you all just, uh, play Fortnite on your cell phones. Works every time. Internet, welcome to Film Theory, the show that takes you down a world of pure imagination and then ruins all the fun by adding math homework. My beloved theorists, when I started doing YouTube nearly 10 years ago, I never dreamed that I'd be in the position I'm in today. One channel with over 10 million subscribers and still going strong. Film Theory here that's getting really darn close to that exact same milestone. You should help us get there, by the way, by subscribing. A channel that was YouTube's most popular live stream for a long time. And now Food Theory, our newest addition to the theorist family, which, if you haven't checked out and subscribed, you should. I mean, you clicked on a video about the math of a fictional candy company, why wouldn't you subscribe to a channel where we talk about the math of a real candy company? We're already knee-deep in testing a lot of interesting stuff on gummy bears, which is yielding some pretty fascinating results for an upcoming episode. So that one's coming down the pipeline, but then there are also episodes that are already on the channel, like how few licks it takes to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop, or the episode that came out today where we come to the definitive answer on whether a hot dog is actually a sandwich. Spoiler Spoiler alert, the classification of pizza and chicken wing is also up for debate. Link is right there on the top of the description or upper right hand corner of the screen. Please, please go check out that channel if you haven't already. We've been working really hard over the last year to make this channel happen, so please validate our efforts by watching and subscribing. Thank you. But you see, that's the whole thing that's incredible here. I am beyond grateful to have people watching four channels worth of content at this point, but not just watching, engaging with all of those channels. And you see, that's the one I want to talk about right now, because if you're the kind of person who pitches theories to me online, you might not think that I see them, or you might think that I don't care. You might think that I'm just gonna sit here and make theories about Marvel movies, Rick and Morty, and Disney until the day my arthritic fingers fall off. And while that is true, it's also true that I see your ideas, and I love those ideas. Case in point, I recently got a tweet from at NeonotJax saying, quote, I want film theory to do a video on the probability that five white kids would get all the golden tickets. At MatPatGT, please, this has bothered me for years. I gotta say, Nia Not Jax, I like your style. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory is one of my favorite movies of all time. If you haven't seen it, shame on your parents. But as the quick refresher, it's a movie about an eccentric candy factory owner, Willy Wonka, who creates a contest to give away his factory and plants golden tickets in five random candy bars to select who can come into the factory for a behind-the-scenes tour. And, as Nia rightly calls out, all the kids that find these tickets are, well, they, they look very similar. But what are the odds of that sort of thing happening? My knee-jerk reaction here is that this has got to be super low, right? Wonka is an international candy distributor, but there are so many complicating factors at play from historical era to demography to international trade policies that, well, the answer is actually far less clear-cut. And that means it is plenty ripe for our theory today. So strap into your psychedelic theory boat and watch your chins for any errant candy counters, because we're heading on one sweet ride. Have you ever noticed that, by the way? I've watched this movie so many times, I notice all the small details. The candy man just clocks that girl with the counter. It is brutal! In order to answer the main question, I'm required to address another question that doesn't exactly have itself a straightforward answer. What defines a white person? Whew. Did you just feel that? It's the icy chill of the internet breathing down my neck, watching everything I say from this point forward in the event that I unintentionally say something offensive. But stand down, PC police, I get it. Racial identity is the kind of thing that gets pretty complicated at both the personal level, since a lot of people don't believe a single racial label identifies them correctly, but also at the global scale, given how often racial data has been used to discriminate. Race, ethnicity, and skin tone don't always match up across different cultures or even person to person, but my interpretation of at Nia Notjack's tweet leads me to believe that they're using the term 
white kids to refer to people of primarily European descent who generally have lighter skin tones. I'm largely taking that definition from a YouTuber named Masaman, who produces some really interesting videos about the history of ethnicity and demographics around the world, so if that's your thing, check out his channel, it's actually really strong. Long story short here, I recognize that not all people of European descent are white, and not all white people are of European descent, but in an effort to define our data sets and answer the question as well as possible, that's the line that we're gonna have to go with today. So getting a calculation for the probability that all five of Wonka's golden tickets would go to white people requires two data sets, the number of all white people on Earth and the total number of all people on Earth. Technically, that gives us the probability of one golden ticket going to a white person, whoever they are, and then we raise that probability to the fifth power since the probabilities of different events are multiplied together to give total probability. And before the statistics nerds come after me, yes, I'm ignoring removal from this calculation. Technically, once the first white person has gotten himself a golden ticket, both the population of white people and the population of planet Earth decrease by one. But since our numbers are already so massive, it's not going to affect things all that much. So all that being said, this should be pretty straightforward, right? Two numbers, boom, calculate the probability, multiply it five times. Well, that's where you'd be wrong. You see, the math is probably the easiest part. It's the first time in the history of ever that's been said. That all is just a bunch of simple multiplication. No, the problem is determining the world population and percentage of white people, because that requires us to know when the movie is taking place, and that's not entirely clear. It's debatable whether it's set at the time that the movie came out, around 1971, or sometime after that, based on Wonka's super advanced technology, or heck, even a time before that, because Charlie's village seems, well, very rural. However, there is one very small detail that answers the question for us. After Charlie finds his golden ticket and starts to run home through a construction site, for a moment, just a moment, we can actually see a peace symbol drawn in chalk behind him. That symbol was invented as a protest sign for nuclear disarmament in 1958 and didn't become widely popular until the late 1960s. So it is safe to say that the movie is set in the present day, by which I mean the present at the time, which is now the past for us. It's around 1970, all right? According to statistics compiled by the United Nations, the world population in 1970 was about 3.632 billion people, less than half of what it is now 50 years later, by the way. The total white population is a little bit harder to calculate because a lot of countries didn't ask about ethnicity on their census at the time. Many countries still don't to this day. However, demographers have estimated the percentage of the world's population that's been white throughout history, giving us approximations of just over 30% of the world in 1950 and just over 20% in the year 2000. Assuming that general trend is correct, the world's population would have been 26.464%, or a little over one in four back back in the 1970s. If we raise those odds to the fifth power, we get ourselves the odds of all five golden tickets going to white kids at a minuscule 0.13% chance. For a little perspective, the white kids sweeping the golden tickets is about one in 800, whereas your chances of catching a foul ball at a professional baseball game are about one in a thousand. Sure, those odds aren't great, but unlikely things do tend to happen a lot. A lot of fly balls and golden tickets out there in the heat. So, case closed, episode over, time Time to hop over to Food Theory and check out the new episode over there? Nope, we are just getting started. Because the calculation we just made makes a few key assumptions, the first of which is that everyone on the planet has access to Wonka bars, and that's just not very realistic. A better calculation would consider which markets Wonka products would have likely been excluded from in the 1970s. And to do that, we need to answer one important question. Where the heck is this movie supposed to take place? Charlie and his family and Willy Wonka all sound American. You can move in immediately. And me? Absolutely. What happens to the, the rest whole of the family? But then random townspeople and Charlie's teacher all have themselves British accents? The test we take each Friday on what we learn during the week will now take place on Monday before we've learned it. Plus, when we see the town from above, it looks like a quaint little village from the middle of Germany. Growing up, I always assumed that the movie took place somewhere in Europe, despite most of the main characters speaking with American accents. But the movie actually gives us the answer via the newscasts. Well, we in America slept. Right here in America. So, strange as it might seem this movie is set in the US. You could be stubborn and say that they're watching American news broadcasts from a foreign country, but we actually see an international broadcast from Paraguay when the South American news covers the fake fifth winner, and we can clearly see that the television refers to it as a satellite broadcast. So yes, it is a weird, heavily European-influenced version of the US, but we are apparently somewhere in the good old US of A. The movie makes Wonka products seem like one of the biggest food brands in the world, so the question now becomes, how widespread would the distribution be for a major US-based international
international food business back in the 1970s. Sorry, this is just one of those moments. Do you see how stupidly over-researched this all is? How deep we go about questions literally no one cares about? Oh sure, let's research the global distribution map of 1970s era US-based foodstuff companies to determine why hashtag Wonka so white. I mean, these are, without exaggeration, some of my favorite episodes, but it's moments like these where the rabbit hole has gotten so deep and the research is just such an obscurely specific topic that I just really appreciate doing this channel. If you like these sorts of episodes too, please subscribe if you haven't already to Film Theory. I really, really want this channel to hit 10 million subscribers and would really appreciate your help getting there. This channel works really hard and it really deserves it, so please, if you could help, that would be amazing. We can't use the real-life Wonka candy brand in this case because that was only a really solid product integration launched in time for the movie, so it doesn't really have that much history to go back on. No, if we're looking for the most accurate business to compare 1970s Wonka to, it's the world's most famous source of excess sugar, Coca-Cola. Based in Atlanta, Georgia, Coca-Cola has been available in different parts of the world for over a hundred years. And in 1970, Coke had the ability to stretch across the planet, just like you see with Wonka candy in the movie. So that's why I chose it as our Wonka stand-in as opposed to, say, another candy company like Hershey, which had themselves smaller international distribution back in the 70s. So, that being said, and this one's important for our calculation, there were a lot of places that you couldn't get Coke in the 1970s. The first major market, the Soviet Union, and for fairly obvious reasons. We had a war, it was a really cold war, we almost blew each other up with nukes several times, and then we didn't. Yay, history! Fanta, a Coca-Cola product, came to Russia in 1979, and Coke a few years after that, which is still too late for our calculations. Market number two that's excluded, China. Interestingly enough, Coca-Cola was first sold in China in 1927, but after Mao's communist revolution in 1949, Coca-Cola and a whole lot of other Western products were outlawed in the country, and Coke couldn't come back into China until 1979. And finally, market number three, the Arab League nations. The Arab League, which consists of mainly Western Asian and North African countries like Egypt, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia, weren't too pleased when Coca-Cola opened up to Israel in 1966, and they levied a boycott against the soda until 1979. So, for our calculations, we'll be deleting the 1970 populations of China, the USSR, and the Arab League nations from our world population totals, reducing it all by 1.1 billion people. It also reduces our total white population by about 228 million. At 733 million divided by 2.457 billion, raised to the fifth power, we get ourselves the new grand total of Wonka So White at 0.24%. That is the chance of all five golden tickets going to white people once you eliminate all the places that Wonka candy bars probably wouldn't be. It's, um, it's twice as likely as our first calculation, but it is still a 1 in 400 long shot. It really just seems like there's this astronomically small chance that the golden tickets would shake out this way, right? Well, when I ask a question that way, you know I'm misleading you. You, you, you do know that, right? I've only been doing that for eight plus years. Because there's one more factor for us to consider, and it's probably the most important one of the bunch. Sure, we've gotten ourselves an idea of how many people had access to Wonka bars back in the 1970s, but we have to account for how many bars those people are going to buy in various parts of the world. Because let's face it, some people are going to buy very, very few, if any, bars, and some little monsters are going to buy a lot of bars. It's all about disposable income and relative wealth. We hear that Veruca Salt, for instance, blitzes through 760,000. Sweetheart, I can't push them no harder. 19,000 bars an hour they're shelling. Now, obviously, she is an extreme outlier. Still, the scene in Charlie's math class shows us that his peers were typically buying a lot of Wonka bars as well. You, Peter Goff, how many did you open? 150. Charlie Bucket, how many did you open? Two. 200? 100? Not 200. Just two. As we can see from Charlie's British for no apparent reason teacher, it's not just commonplace for these kids to buy Wonka bars by the hundreds, it's expected. But not every country in the world has the same disposable income that the US had in the 1970s. For instance, India had more than twice as many people as the United States, but the US's per capita income was 45 times what India's was. So if they're buying candy at a rate consistent with their earnings, it's actually a lot more likely that a golden ticket would show up in the US rather than India. So 
So by combining per capita income data from 1970 with populations by region of the world in the same year, we can adjust the probability to account for purchase power. The regions with predominantly white populations also had themselves very high regional wealth multipliers. North America was 44, Western Europe 24, Australia, New Zealand 23.5. In contrast, the multipliers for the developing world showed just how relatively poor they were in 1970. Africa's multiplier 2.7, South Asia 1.8, Latin America 5.3. So throwing in all of these new considerations into our calculations, suddenly the chances for any one golden ticket going to a white person jump from our initial calculation of about 1 in 4 to now more than 3 in 4. It triples, which means that our final, final estimate for the probability that all five golden tickets go to white kids is... Drum roll, please! What do you mean we don't have a drum roll effect? We've done this bit before. We have it in our... Fine, fine. Don't look for it then. Just give me some dramatic sound effect. You've got mail. Really? Okay. Ugh. 24%. Even if we want to adjust that number and assume that all of the predominantly white regions had the same percentage of white population as the USA, which was 87.7%, likely much lower than in Northern and Western Europe, the final odds still come out to over 12%. So when we consider things like excluded markets and relative wealth, it's still not super likely that all five golden tickets would go to white kids, but it is much, much likelier than it might initially seem. Now, some are between 12% and 24% ain't great odds, but it's far from evidence that the system was rigged. You know what is evidence that the system was rigged? Slugworth. How is it possible that he could get from Charlie's hometown somewhere in the US to the precise locations in Germany and England and across the US before the winners even had time to do a television interview? Of course, we find out at the end of the movie that Slugworth has been working with Wonka the whole time. So if Slugworth knows where to go, that means Wonka knows where to send him, and he knew where where the golden tickets were going. They'd probably even set up Charlie. He buys his golden ticket with a dollar he finds in a storm drain, and then just so happens to run into Slugworth between the candy store and his house. Charlie hasn't been on the news yet, so how does Slugworth know that he's got the last golden ticket? Because he planted the money, and he planted the bar with the golden ticket in it. He may have even gotten the candy man in on it, since Charlie doesn't even pick out the chocolate that had the ticket in it. You ever notice that one? The candy man just picks it off the shelf and hands it to Charlie. Slugworth probably even gave him the instructions. Hand it to a kid that's worthy. Why not try a regular Wonka bar this time? And you see, that's the last nail in the coffin here. What's interesting isn't the fact that all the winners are white, it's the fact that they're all kids. Because as we see throughout the movie, adults are buying these candy bars by the millions because they have the expendable income, and yet somehow, against all probability, the winners are five children. It's because Wonka, through Bruce Slugworth rigged it so kids got the tickets. He needed the five winners to be kids who also just so happened to be white. It's something he admits to in the final scene. I can't go on forever. So who can I trust to run the factory when I leave? Not a grown-up. That's why I decided a long time ago that I had to find a child. And that's why you sent out the golden tickets. That's right. So what are the odds that all five golden tickets go to white kids at Neonaut Jacks? Based on pure probability, one in 800. Based on a bit more research, one in four. But the real probability is one in one. Because the whole thing was rigged from the start. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And just a reminder to go and check out Food Theory. If you like this episode, which, let's face it, you got to the very end of it, you did, then it's important for you to know that a lot of the research that we got for this one was stuff we learned while doing work over on Food Theory, so go check it out. There are a lot of fun episodes on the way, including how to break the Colonel Sanders curse, the dark truth behind Count Chocula, and beating the Chipotle menu. So please, if you haven't yet, give today's new episode of Food Theory a watch, and give that channel a subscribe. Links are on screen right now, and I'll see you across all the channels next week. Week.